England loses to Italy in penalties. It is not coming home. Euro 2020 champions is Italy. Messi finally wins a tournament with Argentina. Argentina win Copa America. Djokovic wins Wimbledon. 20th Grand Slam for Djokovic. Congratulations. Also, Stephen A. Smith says Otani cannot be the face of baseball. Patrick Mahomes has some words for Justin Herbert. We'll touch on that. Kawhi Leonard has surgery to repair his partially torn ACL. All of that on this episode of the Hard to Handle Sports Podcast. Let's get started. First and foremost, I just want to apologize for taking so long for this episode to come out. Um, We're halfway through the week and we just had a jam-packed championship weekend. We had the final of the Copa America. We had the final of the Euros. We have the final of the Wimbledon. We had an NBA final game. We had a lot of stuff going on, entertaining stuff that I wanted to touch on, but there was other stuff that I had to tend to. Also, I wasn't feeling the best, but I'm here now. I'm ready to talk about it. I'm open to discussions. Let's get to it. England loses to Italy in penalties. Rashford, Sancho, Saka missed the last three penalties for England. It is not coming home. The drought is not over. Soccer, football is not coming home. It's not, it's not England's time yet. And man, it was an entertaining final. England took a 1-0 lead very early. It looked like it was coming home. England fans were going crazy. They even... Uh, jumped through barricades to get into the stadium england fans were going crazy i mean i i there is some blame to go to you guys like you guys were going a little crazy it, it, it's, it's becoming to become uh a regular thing for english fans to just go crazy just break rules break laws just complete mayhem but i get it you guys were in your first final in a long time it looked like you guys were gonna win your first major tournament in your lifetime for a lot of people and and your lifetime your grandpa's lifetime it felt like it was it was a coronation of a great great roster of a movement that started with with the semifinals in the world cup so i get the excitement but man italy fought back from that 1-0 deficit took the game to overtime took it to penalties and they showed class they showed uh why that they were the best team throughout the tournament uh they were the best team on Sunday and they deserve to win in my opinion it was a great game um Southgate Southgate definitely deserves a lot of criticism some of the criticism that he, he's been carrying uh throughout throughout the tournament before the tournament and and some new um criticism the, the criticism that he's been carrying that, that we've been talking about since before the tournament is that he plays very slow he plays very conservative this is not the type of football that you want to see your team play it's not pretty on the eye. It's not something that, you know, you like if someone, if you're trying to introduce football to someone, some like a kid or someone that's not into football, you wouldn't put Southgate's England, uh, like a, like a, you put it, you wouldn't put a video of Southgate's England to, to get them into soccer. You wouldn't say, hey, come look at this England game and see how entertaining soccer football is. And, you know, are you a football fan now? Like, someone that's a neutral someone that's barely getting into it will watch that and be like okay you know what this is not my cup of tea i might go you know watch some some wrestling some ufc or some basketball or some football whatever it is southgate's football i think we could all agree is not the prettiest it's not the most entertaining it's not pretty on the eye but so far it's been effective he's gotten to world cup semifinal he got them to the euro final So if they would have won, you know, everything would have been fine with Southgate. Everybody would forgive him for not playing beautiful soccer, for not playing attacking soccer, for, for, you know, just stalling games out, trying to get to the last 80 minutes with a draw or a 1-0 lead. But when you lose, you're open to those, all those criticisms come back. Like, yeah, he played five on the back. He had Luke Shaw, Maguire, Rice, Phillips, Trippier, Stones, Walker, um, all those players, five at the back, two holding midfielders, two midfielders and Declan Rice and Phillips that they're quality they're good midfielders don't get me wrong like they're great but both of them can't push the ball forward they can't take a a midfielder they can't dribble past them they usually get the ball and they pass back or they have to have a pretty like open lane to go forward they mostly pass to the side and back Um, if they get pressed they have to look for the pass they don't really have it in them to dribble past other midfielders um to you know take on two or three midfielders and just jump lines and you know put pressure on the back four 
they're more of your holding midfielders that are going to find the deep ball, you know, keep possession, pass it back to the center backs, you know, be very solid getting by winning the ball back, close down gaps, close down lanes. And you need that. You need that on your team. Uh, by no means am I trying to say that Declan Rice and Phillips are not quality players. They are. But when you have two of them, when you're playing with three center backs and two wing backs, um, it's just it gets very repetitive and it kind of stagnates your team. It, it doesn't let your team be a free flowing attack. It kind of breaks apart your team. You have your up. You have your front three in Kane, Mount, and Sterling, and then you have your back seven. And it's just the team feels very disjointed. And that's what I saw from England. They had a quick start. Credit to Southgate. Um, at halftime, there was a lot of, you know, applause going to him. He's getting his flowers. He's like, you know, he put the back five. The goal came from a wing back to a wing back, right back to left back. Um, Trippier crossing the ball for Luke Shaw. Great goal. So Southgate deserves credit for that. But in the second half, once Italy adjusted, once they started sending people forward, and you could tell that England was getting suffocated, they couldn't get out of their own half they couldn't get anything going they were just getting suffocated in their own half and you you kind of just figured it's only a matter of time till Italy scores a goal and sure enough they scored a goal and if you just take a look at the stats it's kind of surprising that Italy didn't win straight up in the 90 minutes or in the first 120 minutes 19 shots compared to six six shots on target compared to two 66 possession <clears throat> Just like over 200 more passes, 600 or almost double the passes, 820 passes to 426. It, it was just a complete domination of the football by Italy. Way more attacking, way more intent going forward. And England, they were, uh, I think Harry Kane talked about it afterwards, that getting that early goal kind of set them up for failure because they were, they were hey, instead of proposing, instead of going forward, they were kind of hanging on to that one goal lead. And it just played, it played even more into Southgate's tactics. Like, yeah, we got the one-zero lead. Like, and we already played defensive. We already have a defensive lineup in place. Like, the easiest thing to do, like even subconsciously, is to just sit back and and wait for the other opposition. And Southgate definitely, definitely uh, took too long to make uh, changes. Like, I think Sancho should have came in. He came in just to take a penalty. Um, Rashford came in just to take a penalty too. There was. He even, like, he did it on a corner kick, which is, like, a no-no for, like, any any coach. Like, don't do subs on a corner kick because you're going to lose your mark. The player is coming in, not really concentrated. It's easy to give up a goal. But he really wanted um, Sancho and Rashford to take a penalty, So and, and they were running out of time. that You didn't know if there was going to be another stoppage for them to come in. So he just made that substitution in the corner kick. I, it would have been crazy if they scored on that corner kick. He would have gotten criticism. But then they went to penalties and both of them missed. And he put Saka, a 19-year-old, in the decisive number five penalty spot when he's never taken a professional penalty, like for, for Arsenal or for anybody. So all of those criticisms, I think Southgate definitely deserves them. Like and and there was a Grealish said afterwards that he he put his name, he he raised his hand, he wanted to take a penalty, but Southgate basically said no. Like these are the ones I've seen in practice, these are the ones that I want to shoot for England and with the history that Southgate has uh, in like for England missing penalties before people are saying, is he really the, the guy that should be picking? That's another criticism. But for England, they're not going to get rid of Southgate. This is the this is the furthest they has gone with any coach in forever. Semifinal in 2018, final this year in the Euros. And, you know, they're very there's a lot of optimism for England going into the World Cup. I just think this was their chance. They should have capitalized right here. Almost all their home games, almost all their games in this tournament were in England. They were they were the home team. Uh, Donnarumma, when he stopped the final penalty on Saka, he didn't even know that he had won. If you see the video, you kind of see that he he's just walking back to the goalkeeper spot <clears throat> because 98% of the people that were at Wimbledon, or were that, not Wimbledon, that were at, uh, damn, I forget the stadium name, uh, that were at the stadium, uh, they were uh, they were English. Uh, they were Wembley. 99, 98, 99% that were at Wembley, they were English fans. There was only like a thousand Italian fans there. So you couldn't really hear the cheering of Italian fans when they had won the penalty. 
which just goes to show how well, that's another advantage that England had. This should have been their tournament. They should have won it right here. Um, and they didn't. They fall short. And I think Southgate deserves a lot of criticism. Very defensive minded. A lot of attacking players in in the bench that he didn't utilize. Like He was scared to go go for the win. He had the early one goal lead. And he never wanted to go for that second goal to go for the kill. And we'll see how they do in the World Cup. I think England should be like one of the top five, six favorites. But it's going to be even more complicated. They got the easier side of the draw again. Like lately they've been getting like easy draws and easier paths to the final. They had to beat up on Germany. But other than that, the, if you look at the rosters that they played against, England should have been like, you know, you expected England to to get to the final when they played against Germany I said the winner of this is making it to the final and sure enough England did but <clears throat> Italy deserves a lot of credit I just I don't want to just touch on England I also want to talk about Italy Italy missed the World Cup in 2018 uh, it looked like their soccer program was going down in flames even their league was kind of going down and these last few years the Serie A has been more entertaining they're getting more talent in the Serie A and now they come back with Mancini putting on a great show. They came in hot. They hadn't lost the game in forever. And now they are the champions of Euro 2020. This is how you build a program. This is how you build a roster. And uh, just props to Bonucci, props to Cellini, two elder men that have been there forever. They're getting very um, long in the tube. You know, We don't know how many more years we have of Cellini and Bonucci, but they've been great. It's Italy is known for having great center backs from Nesta to Maldini. Like, there's just been so many good center backs and Bonucci and Cellini carrying the flag right now. Donnarumma, great goalkeeper, man of the tournament, player of the tournament, had another great game. Two penalties, three, two penalty stumps in the in the decisive penalties. Just all around, like, people were saying that Italy doesn't have a world-class player to to win them games and stuff like that well they have a lot of really quality players they have a world-class coach and they just they just they they love their jersey they play for their jersey they play tough they play smart they know how to make a smart foul um like Bonucci did or Cellini did on on Saka they're just they play very smart they play smart soccer they're entertaining again they have uh, more attacking players they don't just sit back they like to have possession and go forward so just shout out to Italy. Great tournament. What a great turnaround. It's a great story to hear from missing a World Cup to winning the Euros is just incredible. So shout out to Italy. Shout out to their whole soccer program. And for England, I mean, I, I hope I hope that, you know, Southgate changes it up a little bit. Yeah, these defensive games, um, these defensive setups, they might get you to some finals. They might make you go deep. But I think with the talent that you have right now, um you could do a lot of damage you have Grealish you have Rashford um you have Sancho you even have Cabret Lewin Saka there's a lot of young young players to pair up with Sterling and Kane and you could do a lot of damage so I mean England English should help uh, you know hold their head high this is this is by no means a bad result or a bad tournament and they should be one of the one of the protagonists for the World Cup next year. But I do want to say that, man, that racist stuff, all that internet hate that they're shooting down on Rashford, uh, Sancho, and Saka, that, that needs to stop. That There's no place in football for, for that. And, you know, it's, it's this is not the first time that it happens. So I hope everyone that condemns all the people that do that and, hope, I mean, these players already have it tough enough. Rashford put on a great... Um, picture a great text after the game on how he felt he loves the England shirt he loves being from England and it's sad to see people not like you know give them their respect or just say hurtful things to them so just needed to say that to to wrap this segment up like you know that's not cool you guys I know this is not going to change anybody people like being vile people like being like you know disgusting rude and this is not really going to change anything but if you're one of those people that you know condemns them calls them out for it you know my I tip my hat to you. This is what we got to do moving forward. Messi finally wins a trophy with Argentina. Argentina defeats Brazil 1-0 in the Copa America final. Messi is finally champions with Argentina. He has done it. Congratulations to Messi. Shout out to Messi. The team showed up in the final. Um, 
that's all you could say. A lot of the times the team had let Messi down. That was some of the the storylines. That's some of the things that we talked about going into this final. Is, is Messi going to get help? Is it just going to be Messi? And his team, you know, showed up. Early goal, DePaul, beautiful ball to Di Maria. Di Maria, exquisite chip over um, Ederson. And since then, Argentina just held on. It was kind of, it wasn't the most entertaining game, in my opinion. I expected more from Argentina versus Brazil. Um, There was only four shots on target the whole game, one of them being the goal. So other than the goal, there was just three shots on target. Um, It was a very, very sloppy, stagnant game. Um, Very physical. There was a lot of fouls. 22 fouls on Brazil, 19 fouls on Argentina. So that we had over 40 fouls in the game. So we're averaging a foul like every two minutes, basically. So just a lot of fouls in this final. A lot of stoppages, a lot of, you know, people rolling on the floor. A lot of people going to the referee asking for, you know, yellow or red. So compared to the Euro, this Copa America um, final was not like as entertaining. And I, I thought it was. I hoped it was. Argentina has a good roster. Brazil have a good roster. The names, it was Brazil versus Argentina. But it... You know, it didn't it didn't really excite me, but nevertheless, congratulations to Argentina. Congratulations to Messi. He has that monkey off the back. Uh, it, like in the eighty eighth minute, or maybe like the ninetieth, he had a one on one to seal the deal two zero, and he he tried to he, instead of shooting, I thought he was gonna shoot right away, but he tried to cut back on the goalie and kind of like walk in with the ball, and the ball stayed behind him. And he kind of like slipped and fell. And I was just like, damn, is, is this it again? Is this going to happen again? Like, are we going to look back at this messy, clear miss? And because at that point, Brazil wasn't really getting too many clear chances. It's not like they were making a Martinez a hero. By no means was Martinez the hero. They never really pressured him like that. But they were getting some corners. They were getting, uh, you know, some crosses into the Argentina box where you were like, okay, they might be able to get something right now. Like, I could kind of see like some pressure like if you're an Argentina fan you're at the edge of your seat you're like come on just get everything out so you were feeling Brazil kind of build some momentum in the last five ten minutes so when Messi had that one-on-one against Ederson you were like oh he's gonna put them away this is it this is a picture picture perfect moment Messi scoring the second goal in the final to clinch the final for Argentina and he misses it and it's like a clear clear chance and the first thing you hear in your head is like damn this kind of reminds me of the 2014 World Cup when he when he couldn't finish that one on one against Newer, and you're like, damn, is this is this the same thing? Like, you kind of see the momentum going towards Brazil's, you know, team, and you're like, if Brazil somehow finds a way to score the tying goal, and we go to the fi- we go to penalties and and Argentina loses, the criticism for Messi is gonna be insane. Like for him to miss such a clear chance, but fortunately for him, the defense was stagnant. They held on to Brazil. They held off Brazil and Argentina and Messi get their first title. It was a beautiful sight, the way they were throwing Messi up. You know, everyone kind of felt the monkey off the back, not just Argent- not just Messi, but the whole squad. Argentina hadn't won a major tournament, a major international tournament in 28 years. And that's just unacceptable for such a great soccer country like Argentina. So it was a great moment for Argentina. There was scenes, the scenes in Buenos Aires, the scenes in Argentina were ridiculous. Um, they're still, you know, fighting COVID over there. They're, they're not over it. They're, we're all still fighting COVID, but they did not care. There was no social social distancing going on. It was just a celebration for Argentina, and I don't blame them. Uh, they've they've had to suffer through a lot of Copa America final defeats. They've had to suffer through a lot, like a World Cup final defeat. Uh, they've had to suffer through having the best player or one of the best players in the world every year year in and year out and not coming home with the glory so for them after 28 years to get a title i mean by all means i I was i was happy for argentina fans somewhat you know i'm I'm a a mexican fan so i could only be so happy like i root for mexico so it was cool it was nice to see them like you know win their championship and now now they're gearing up for the world cup that monkey's off the back for argentina they have at least won one um international tournament for argentina so now Argentina, in my opinion, they're going to play more loose, and they're a real threat for the World Cup. But this Copa America, by no means, I haven't really done videos on Copa America because it was not the most entertaining soccer. It was more it was more of the same of this final. Like, uh, not so many shots on target. 
uh, a lot of a lot of fouls, a lot a lot of fouls, a lot of uh, you know players berating the ref, a lot of uh, uh, stopping and starting again because of all the fouls, and the final just you know really encapsulated what the what the tournament was. Um, usually, Copa America invites other teams because um, South America doesn't have enough teams to build a, like a big tournament. They only have 10 nations in there. So usually, you know, Mexico gets invited. The U.S. gets invited. Japan gets invited. Qatar gets invited. I think even like Australia has gotten invited. I don't know. They invite like a lot of teams to make the, the field more competitive. This time there were 10 teams. There's a lot of group stage, group stage games just to eliminate two teams. Only one team from each group did not make it to the knockout stages. So I, th- I thought it was not like that important to cover the group stages and you kind of just felt like it was going to be an argentina versus brazil final you kind of saw it coming um a lot of the teams in that region have really their the rosters have weakened through the years uruguay you know they still rely on suarez and cavani and they're getting old they're not the same players musleta is getting old too chile i like they still rely on alexis sanchez and and vargas and um <coughs> And like uh, Ecuador and Colombia, Colombia is doing like pretty decent, but um, you know they don't have like a star player, like a star star player, like James Rodriguez was at one time. And Ecuador, you know, they don't have the top top end talent either. So the region, in my opinion, is kind of weak right now. You kind of just expected Brazil and Argentina to get to the final, even though these teams, in my opinion, are not anywhere near as good as the historic Argentinian teams or the historic. Brazilian teams like no offense to Brazil or the Argentinian squad but uh, we have Neymar starting with Everton with Charleston Fred Casemiro Lucas pa- um, Paquia, uh, Paqueta like these players they wouldn't be making some uh, some of the other Brazil rosters uh, the same could be said for Argentina but all in all, it was a pretty entertaining tournament. It was just great to have soccer, football, like, all day long. You had Copa America. You had Euros in the mornings, Copa America in the afternoon. So it was it was great. The summer of soccer, the summer of football lived to it lived, lived up to its hype. I really enjoyed it. And congratulations to Messi. Congratulations to Argentina for winning Copa America 2020 or 2021. Djokovic defeats Berrettini in four sets, losing the first set and then winning the last three. He wins his 20th Grand Slam in his career. He ties Federer. He ties Nadal. And in many, that's all he needed to do. He was already the GOAT in a lot of people's mind. Now he's tied with them in Grand Slams. There's no argument in a lot of people's minds that you could have for the other big three. It is Djokovic and nobody else. And me being an Nadal fan, I kind of agree. It's kind of hard to to argue against Djokovic being the GOAT, especially the way he's playing right now. He's in fire form. Uh, Berrettini, Berrettini, he, he played very competitive. Um, it was an entertaining match. Um, Djokovic flew through the whole Wimbledon. He lost one set going into the final, and it was the first set of Wimbledon. Since then, he finished off round one with three straight sets. And every every round, the knockout stages, every round till the final, it was a 3-0, 3-0, 3-0, 3-0 sets. So Djokovic came out firing. I just wanted to see a great final. I wanted to see, you know, competitive. I wanted it to be competitive. I wanted it to be entertaining. I didn't just want Djokovic to put, like, just wipe the floor with this guy, even though that would have been cool too. But I just wanted to see some competition Berrettini won the coin toss. He got to decide if he was going to serve or if he's going to receive. And, you know, everybody thought he was going to serve because he has one of the most powerful serves on the field, on the court. And to everyone's surprise, he let Djokovic serve. And both men, both both of them came out jittery. Both of them came out kind of nervous. Djokovic was not having his best serve game. Berrettini was kind of missing on some easy returns. And when all of that was was happening, you kind of thought, damn, Berrettini has to take advantage of this, has to take advantage of Djokovic not playing his best on this first set, and he has to he has to win, man. He, ha- he there's no way he loses this first round, 
and he has a chance to win the match. He has to win this first set because if he doesn't, Djokovic is finally gonna warm up and you're you're toast. You're done. Once once he get once he gets up to his A game or his even like his B plus A minus game, there's nothing you could do. He's the best player in tennis right now. There is nothing you can do. So when he's playing his C plus B minus game at the start of the of the match, you gotta take advantage. You gotta, you know, grab the bowl by its horns and you just gotta try to keep him down. Because if you're down, it's almost impossible to make a comeback on Djokovic. So to Berrettini's credit, he was down against Djokovic in the first set. It didn't look like he was going to take advantage of his slow start. And Berrettini turns it up, forces a tie break, and beats Djokovic in the tie break 7-4, which was just amazing in my opinion. Like, that was a sick comeback. I was pumped. I was like, okay, Berrettini, like, let's do it. Like, I'm I'm pumped. Like, I'm ready to see this final. I want to see history on either side if Berrettini wins. It, it, it could be the start of a great day for Italians. They could win Wimbledon. They could win the Euro final. If Djokovic, if Djokovic makes another comeback like he did in the French Open, then I'm all for it too because the French Open was super entertaining, the final, how he came back against um, Tsitsipas. So I was I was for it. I was like, damn, Berrettini, good job. Um, he, had a, he had a wrap on his leg, so we didn't know. Um, there was some worry that that was going to slow Berrettini down. And if, if you're hurt against Djokovic, you have no chance. But to everyone's surprise, Berrettini came back in the first set, won in tie break, and you were like, okay, like this is gonna be a good one. And Djokovic took a lead in the second set, a double break, and Berrettini got a break back, and he almost got the double break. And you were like, damn, I was texting my friends. I was like, damn, is Berrettini gonna come back in the second set too? I was getting pumped. I was like, damn, like this is really happening. He's about to come back, and and you know, we're really gonna have a great match. But Djokovic, calm and composed, never getting too high, never getting too low, you know, did his thing, closed out set number two. And then after that, it was just steady. He broke him once in the third set, and then he won that one 6-4-2. And he closed it out in the fourth set 6-3. Djokovic, you know, he gave his props for Berrettini. He said that, you know, powerful serve. He's a big body. He, he has a powerful um, forehand. So I was impressed by Berrettini. I think he has a bright future. I believe he's like 26 years old, so he can still get better. Um, he's going to continue to get better. His serves, when his serves are on point, when he when he goes on some streaks where his serves are just like ridiculous. So Berrettini, he, he, by all means, I want to give him his props. He had a great final. He had a great tournament. Congratulations to Berrettini. You did, Itali you did Italy proud. You said... You said, I think you kind of pumped up the Italians for the Euro final too. They saw you, how competitive you were as an underdog against Djokovic in England. I think you might have had a hand in how well Italy came back to win in England in the Euros. But Djokovic, my man, what a legend. He gets his 20th Grand Slam title. He's the favorite for the U.S. Open. He's the favorite for the Olympics. Federer just dropped out of the Olympics. Nadal already um, jumped out of the Olympics. Who's going to stop Djokovic? Man, I, I don't know. No one. I, I don't have too much money, but I might put all my savings on Djokovic to win um, Tokyo 2020 with no fans. It might be a little tough, um, but it's not like the fans are ever really on Djokovic's side. Uh, I don't know if it's his persona or how honest he is. or I don't know. But a lot of the times, the crowd always seems to be rooting for the underdog, rooting for the opposition. But it never deters Djokovic. He says that when other people are cheering for other people, when they're cheering for his opposition, he just pretends they're cheering for him. He has that mental fortitude that that he could just make anything happen in his head. It's kind of like Michael Jordan when he said, when he just made up stories about other people to fuel him that weren't even true. Some crazy stuff like that, that... Uh, if you watch The Last Dance, you're like, damn, this was kind of like a maniac. How how can he really, like, believe that he said that when he... How could he believe his opposition, like, dissed him or, or talked bad about him when nothing was even said? Just to get an edge. I think Djokovic is the same way. You don't have to really say anything to him or you could do whatever to him. He's going to... Uh, he's going to, like, interpret it in a way that motivates him, in a way that uh, fuels him and just pumps him up even more. So... I think Djokovic, not only is he the best 
at the tennis court right now. He, his serves, his returns, he's the return king. Like you might have the best serves, but this man is gonna find a way to return it and just kill your confidence. All the energy you use to have these powerful serves, and Djokovic just returns them. It's a sight to behold, and no matter if the fans are for him or against him, it's always gonna have a positive effect with him because, I mean, he's just so mentally strong he could turn it up whenever so Djokovic you are a legend you are a monster it's, it's been a pleasure to see you this summer this end of spring taking the French Open taking Wimbledon now you're going for the the Golden Grand Slam I think is what they call it where you win all four of them I think it's only been done once and I think Djokovic could easily do it he he hasn't won a gold medal in his career He's a heavy favorite for Tokyo. I'll be surprised if he doesn't win it. And for the U.S. Open, once he comes to the U.S., heavy favorite again. We'll see if anyone's able to stop him. Um, Bertini, happy for him. But Djokovic, what do you guys think? Can anyone st stop this train? Can anyone stop this monster? Is anyone going to be able to defeat Djokovic in 2021? Because for my money, there is no one that could defeat Djokovic the way he is playing, barring injury, knock on wood, don't want none of that for him because he's playing exquisite tennis. It's beautiful to see. I just think he's going to run through it. And I think with Federer's age, with Nadal being prone to injury a year older than him, man, there is Djokovic could run the table this year. He could win three out of four next year. He could just... He, by the time the career is over, it might look silly that we ever had a discussion who the GOAT was. Because Djokovic, he's 34, but he's playing like a young 34, and the end is not near for Djokovic. And he keeps saying that, you know, they're all going to retire like around the same time, like so that like they're going to keep going till they all keep going. But obviously, Federer is going to stop first, and it looks like Nadal is going to stop second. And Djokovic, he might just keep going till he his body won't let him. If I don't see, I don't see why not. I don't see why he can't be like the Tom Brady of tennis and just play till he's 42. Um, he's always gonna be good at returning. He's a great defensive player. I have no idea why he can't play till his late 30s, early 40s, and potentially finish with 28 or some 30 Grand Slams, which sounds ridiculous which sounds crazy, but I think he could do it. He's playing that good of tennis. He's that far removed from the competition right now. It's Djokovic, a gap, and then the next person. And even if he gets older, that gap is so big right now that, I mean, he could keep playing forever. I'm, I'm astonished by what this man is doing. And I want to give him his flowers, and I want to give him his congratulations. And I like I like what he does after he gets the victories. He goes, whew. And then he turns, and he gives everyone a little like thing like i don't know it's sick it's cool i'm a fan of djokovic i applaud him let me know what you guys think can anyone defeat djokovic and how many grand slam titles is he gonna finish with stephen a smith says that otani cannot be the face of the mlb because he does not know english um he can't speak english he was saying that someone that has is the face of the mlb should be able to you know be able to market better I think that's a bunch of baloney um he has since you know issued an apology uh people called him out on it people said like you're so blinded by you know i don't know what you're blinded by but uh, they call it racism they call it you know just being ignorant and stephen a smith out of all people he should know better he's been in the business for years and years and years he's been on the spotlight he's talked about racism against african americans against other communities and he's Speaked out on it, you know, very vigorously from the heart, very adamant. So for him to say that is just, it's a very bad look on Stephen A. Smith. He said it very convincingly too. And then the backlash came and then he issued an apology. And it's just, it was upsetting. I, it caught me by surprise when I saw it. I was like, wow, like this man's very bold for saying something like that. Like, especially in the day and age that we live in today, uh, where Asian American hate is on the rise because of COVID, people ignorant people just blaming it on the Asian community and like it's just random attacks on Asian American people and you know so much awareness that's being spread about you know helping your fellow Asian 
community and you know the things you can do so that these communities aren't marginalized as much and Stephen a smith says this and it's just like man come on what are you doing like like from no angle that he was trying to say is this is this comment any like remotely accurate like i know i know he only covers like american sports like mlb and nfl and basketball and for espn you know he sometimes does hockey and they make him cover a soccer like every blue moon once in a blue moon but that this is nothing new in sports like especially if if you follow like worldwide sports if you don't if you don't if you're not just in the shell that um, the u.s is like there's coaches for for football for soccer overseas that don't even know the language there's players playing in england playing in spain that don't know spanish don't know english um and they don't know Italian, but they go to the Serie A, they go to La Liga, they go to the Premier League because they know that those are the best leagues. And those leagues are respected because of that. Like the EPL, the Serie A, La Liga, they're all respected because of how many uh, international players, how many players across the seas, whether you're in Asia, North America, South America, uh, some other european countries from africa everybody wants to flock to these countries these leagues because they understand that these leagues are the best leagues in the world and no one really shines down on them everyone just uh, just it's understood that like man if i could get if i could get you know this player that doesn't know english that doesn't know spanish i like who cares he's great at the sport and all the fans love him kunaguero didn't know english going to manchester city and he he killed it i mean gareth bell is not the best example because he didn't really kill it for real madrid but he understood that real madrid was you know one of the biggest teams in the world it could take his popularity it could take you know his his uh, nor notoriety to the next level so he made that move to real madrid knowing not knowing spanish it didn't stop him and because he knew that going to real madrid was going to be great for his career and the spanish media and all of us that were Real Madrid fans were happy. No, none of us were like, damn, Bell, we're looking back, obviously we could criticize him for what he hasn't done. But at the time, it was just like, damn, look at this monster that played for Tottenham. And the things he could do with us while having Cristiano Ronaldo is like unlimited. Like, it's just, it, this is great. And I don't think anybody ever thought like, oh, damn, this guy doesn't know Spanish. Like, that, it, like why should he be you know, one of the faces of La Liga. And and just like that, like MLB, if we were just talking about MLB, like there's so many Dominican players, there's like Cuban players, there's a lot of Spanish speaking players that don't know English and they've been the face of MLB too. And like that, M the NBA has gotten um, internationalized a lot as the, like, you know, in these recent years, we got Jokic just winning the MVP. We have Giannis coming from Greece. We have a lot of players coming from overseas. And for Stephen A. Smith to say that, it's just, I don't know, it says a lot about him. It kind of revealed some of his character. Like, he should know better. He should know better. It's like, he, he didn't need someone to tell him. Like, it's it's very saddening. Like He let a lot of people down, especially because I know a lot of people are Stephen A. Smith's fans. Or they kind of like, you know, the the banter that he says, or like they just appreciate his his rowdiness, how how uh, his expressions, how loud he is, and for him to say stuff like that is just like, come on, man, like really, like open your eyes, don't be blinded, don't don't be saying dumb stuff like this. You're one of the biggest voices in sports media, if not the biggest, and when you say stuff like that, it's just it's very it's saddening, and I feel sorry for Tani. Um, but I know I know it's not gonna affect Otani. Otani seems like a good guy. He's wholesome. He's a good guy. He 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 should he should be the face of the MLB. Him and Tatis, completely different players, completely different personalities. So I think you can market them in different ways. Um, Tatis being very you know flamboyant, very loud, very out there. He plays that role very good. You know he has the swagger. He knows what he's doing. The chains, all that stuff. That's great. Otani, he's a little more laid back. But he has the game. Like we haven't seen anything like Otani in forever since Babe Ruth. Everyone keeps saying it. The way he's getting home runs, just hitting the ball, super, like just incredible. Like the way he hits the ball, it's, it's second to none. 
the way he pitches is second to none. We should just appreciate the talent. Um, and it's not just the MLB. Like, anywhere you go, uh, if you play good, it doesn't matter if you can't speak the language because we're, we're, the sport is going to is gonna adjust to, to fit your needs, um, which is crazy because um, Osaka just came to my head how, you know, tennis didn't really uh, help her out. But for the most part, I could think of like uh, Bielsa, the the Leeds United head coach. He's the he's the coach for Leeds, and he doesn't know English. For the Premier League, the the greatest the greatest league in the world in terms of football, in terms of soccer, Marcelo Alberto Bielsa. He, he just knows Spanish, and he's a Premier League head coach, and you never hear any criticism. So I think Stephen A. Smith just needs to, you know, get educated and not be saying just random stuff to get reactions. Um, I think I know a lot of these shows. That's what drives their ratings. That's what drives, you know, their viewership. So maybe that's what he was trying to go for, or maybe he's just a, you know, he's a bad person. He he really believes what he said, but he apologized for it. Um, if anything, he's brought attention to the subject. He's brought awareness. And hopefully that's the positive that we could take from this. But I, for one, think Otani could for surely be the face of baseball. And I'm glad Stephen A. Smith apologized. But, you know, it does seem like it was a little forced. Patrick Mahomes kind of did a slight towards Justin Herbert. A fan was heckling him while he was playing golf, saying, you're a bum saying Justin Herbert you better watch out for Justin Herbert or Justin Herbert's coming for you and Patrick Mahomes you know went ahead and responded to the heckler and said um I'll see it when I believe it I, I'm pretty sure everyone knows that he meant to say I'll believe it when I see it he said it backwards he said I'll see it when I believe it you know we all know what he's trying to say but people are making a big deal about it people are saying Patrick Mahomes you know doesn't have respect for Justin Herbert. Does he really not um, think Justin Herbert is that good? Is he criticizing him? Is he saying he's not really a threat? Um, people are saying that like the Chiefs better watch out because the Chargers are coming. There's a lot of you know there's a lot of takes that are coming from this. I think Patrick Mahomes was just trying to you know shut up the the heckler. He was just trying to get back at him without saying like a, like anything too negative or anything that would make him look bad. I think Patrick Mahomes. You know, he was playing golf. He was relaxed. He was trying to have a good time. And a heckler's over there talking nonsense. That's not the time to talk nonsense, to talk uh, football, to, to, you know, banter Mahomes. And he just, you know, the guy I mentioned Herbert, it wasn't, it was not like Patrick Mahomes just brought it up by himself. But if we were to dive into this, if we were to take a look, um, if Patrick Mahomes did mean this, man, I think Justin Herbert is coming. Um, I really rate Justin Herbert like very, very highly. As far as the young quarterbacks, um, other than Patrick Mahomes, I would take Justin Herbert above anybody. And I know this is a hyperbole. I know some people might be like, hey, what about Lamar Jackson? He's a MVP already. Or, you know, Dak Prescott has more experience. I know he's coming back from the injury, but, you know, he's he's done it longer. Or, you know, anybody else that you could think of um josh allen or you know baker mayfield anybody else you 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 could put them up against justin herbert i would take justin herbert above all of those young quarterbacks other than patrick mahomes i rate justin herbert very very highly and i think he is coming that's why i think patrick mahomes i don't think patrick mahomes is is blind or i don't think he doesn't respect justin herbert i think he can see the talent justin herbert Started his first game against Patrick Mahomes, I believe, like week two of the last year's NFL season. Um, Tyrod Taylor had a lung punctured because someone put a needle in, in the wrong spot. Justin Herbert didn't even know he was going to start. And he got the call like 15, 10 minutes before kickoff. And he was like, what the? He was like, what the hell? Like, I don't I didn't even know I was going to start. I had none of the first team reps. I, I, I wasn't mentally prepared to start. And he took the reigning champions Chiefs at that time all the way down the wire and Patrick Mahomes had to, you know, pull a bunny out of the hat to get the win. And that's when you were like, whoa, why would we ever go? The, the Chargers, all the Charger fans, I, I'm from San Diego, so I have a lot of them. 
on my TL, on, you know, texting me. And they were like, damn, why would we ever go back to Tyrod Taylor? Justin Herbert is the real deal. And sure enough, they kept him as a starter. And he won Rookie of the Year. And he had a great season. Even by Not even by a rookie. Like, if you just put his season, like, as a pro. If he was a five-year pro and he had the season, like, you would be thinking, like, damn, this is a breakout season. Good job for this guy. He's great. So, I don't think Patrick Mahomes is dumb. I don't think he's blind. I, everyone can see it. Justin Herbert is the real deal. He, he the, the the way he flicks the ball off his hand, the way he attacks defenses going down the field. Um, he's coming. He's he's an elite elite talent. I think I've said before that Patrick Mahomes and Justin Herbert have the the, the potential to be the greatest quarterback battle inner division quarterback battle that we've ever had. Like two quarterbacks at the top relatively like at the same age like a four-year difference they're gonna you know if herbert pretends if herbert thinks he's gonna stay with the chargers mahomes is already gonna stay there for like 10 plus years um he signed that contract justin herbert will see how long he stays with the chargers i'm pretty sure they're gonna keep him forever so they're gonna be battling it out for years and years to come and i do think that they have the potential to be you know the greatest interdivisional quarterback competition we've ever had in the nfl career like by the times their careers are done, they might have played against each other like 30 times. Like it's like some crazy number where you're just like, wow, we saw 30, 30 battles of Justin Herbert, Bristol Mahomes. And we might even see it in the playoffs, in the wild card, um, in the in the conference finals. Like it's gonna be something really nice to see both of them if they both stay in the AFC West. And I think this is this is good, uh this is good fuel for that rivalry. Like we're very early in this rivalry. They just Justin Herbert just came into the league. They've only played twice against each other, but the spark is already there. The the fire has been lit. The Chargers, as a team, look like they could compete better this year. The Chiefs, the Chiefs are obviously there. They're going to be contenders for years and years to come. The Chargers look like they should be, you know, a top eight, top six team in the AFC this year. So we'll see how they do, but. This just adds fuel to the fire. I'm loving what I'm seeing from Justin Herbert and Mahomes on the field last year. Uh, you know, this little banter that's going on right now. I wonder if Justin Herbert's going to respond, if he's going to go on some podcast and say anything. So I'm very excited. What do you guys think? Is this good? Is this bad? Does you think uh, there was any wrong with what uh, Patrick Mahomes said or you think uh, it was warranted? And do you share the sentiment with me that this has the possibility of being, you know, the best interdivisional quarterback competition in NFL history. Um, or let me know what are, what other, you know, battles there was over time. Um, you know, in recent years, we've had uh, Watson versus Luck for a little bit. We had Roethlisberger versus Flacco. You know, we had Breeze against um, Matt Ryan. We had Breeze against um, Cam Newton. Cam Newton against Matt Ryan. There's been some good ones. There's been some good ones. Rivers against Manning, um, Manning against Schaub when Schaub was good. Like there was some good. There's been some good battles over the years of between quarterbacks in their division. But I just think with the age that Herbert has, with the age that Mahomes has, Mahomes already locked up for ten years with the Chiefs. Herbert, it looks like the Chargers will be foolish to not give him a long term deal when he's ready for one. So I'm just I'm seeing the potential for this to be the greatest quarterback competition between quarterbacks in the same division but let me know what you guys think Kawhi Leonard had surgery to repair his partially torn ACL um sad news for Clipper fans sad news for NBA fans sad news for Kawhi Leonard fans sad news for New Balance fans because you know he's the face of New Balance and he's hurt again what does this mean it means that the Clippers are going to be fighting for their playoff lives next year it means PG-13 is going to have a bigger load next year. So hopefully, you know, he stays healthy for the season. But it's going to be a big load. Everything's going to be on his shoulders. The Clippers are going to have a hard time keeping Reggie Jackson. Um, he's going to make a lot of money. He had a spectacular run in the playoffs. Um, I think he wants to get paid one more time before he retires. And he understands that if he stays with the Clippers, he's going to give them a big, big discount. So I don't think that's going to happen. I think he's going to, he's going to look elsewhere to get paid. So... This Clipper team is going to take a hit. Reggie Jackson is going to be out, gone. Kawhi Leonard is going to be hurt. 
Um, we also got to see if he's even going to opt in, opt out. Um, he has one year left on his contract, the player option, I believe, in the $30 million range. So we'll see what he does. Kawhi Leonard has been injury-prone for his career. He's had leg issues is the whole reason he left the Spurs because he thought the medical team wasn't taking him seriously. So we'll see how this plays out. He's already a player that likes to load manage. So coming back from an ACL injury nearing age of 30, like an, like people have said, he's an older 30. He's not a young spring chicken. So it's going to be hard. It's gonna, there's a lot of decisions that have to be made. Is Kawhi Leonard going to have – is he going to opt into his player option? Is he going to opt out? If he opts out, is he going to look? Is he going to test the market? Are teams going to offer him a max? Um, I'm looking at you, Knicks. I'm looking at the Hawks. I'm looking at some other teams that are, are close, that think they're close and need a player. I'm looking at the Heat. All these teams that were rumored to offer him a deal, I'm looking at the Mavs. Are they still going to try to offer him a max when he's been injury prone, when he's load managed the last couple of years, and now he has a surgery to his ACL, and he's 30 years old? We'll see how many teams offer him a deal if he opts out. Will the Clippers even offer him the max if he opts out? Will they just cut ties with him? They'll just like, you know what? Bad move. We we got closed, but we couldn't get it done. Or if he opts in, like how do the Clippers play this out? Do they offer him an extension still with one year on his contract? There are some people, there's some cynical people out there that are saying Kawhi Leonard is going to opt in for the Clippers, get his $30 million, not play a single game this upcoming season, and then walk at the end of next season. And, man, that kind of sounds familiar with what he did to the Spurs many moons ago. I believe it was four years ago, five years ago, when he left the Spurs. That kind of sounds around the same. Around the same. I think, uh, what's his name? Um, Skip Bayless said that he was going to get surgery, and sure enough, he did. And he also said that Kawhi Leonard was not happy with the Clippers medical team. So if there's any truth to that, I mean... Skip Bayless already hit on saying that he was going to get surgery. If he's correct, saying that Kawhi Leonard was not happy with the with the Clippers medical team, and we might be heading down that same road. History repeats itself. And if Kawhi Leonard does that, that would be some savage stuff. And that would just add to the, the Clippers' misery, the Clippers' bad luck. Um, what do I think is going to happen? I think he opts into his 30-year, into, into his player option. He he play he plays it out. He might come back at the end of next season. The Clippers maybe make the playoffs, make eighth or seventh seed without him. It's gonna be tough for them in the West to get a high seeding with just with Kawhi Leonard hurt, with Reggie Jackson out, and uh, and then after that we'll see. What well, they'll be, we'll see how he comes back at the end of next season. Um, we'll see if he's back to Kawhi Leonard. They're gonna have a sample size. They're gonna see him. You know, hopefully at the end of the regular season and a little bit in the playoffs, and then they'll make the decision after next year. So I think that's that's the most realistic possibility. He opts into his last year, and they just play the wait-and-see game. Or the Clippers are just panicking. Uh, they know that they put all their eggs in this Kawhi Leonard and PG-13, you know, duo, and they already paid PG-13. He's already tied up with them. And they just they just say, you know what? Let's let's roll the dice. Let's hope Kawhi Leonard, you know, comes back as not a shell of himself, but you know, partially or mostly the same. And he he you know lives up to the contract that we're gonna offer him. And they just give him the extension right now this off season. And they just like cross their fingers and hope he comes back strong. But it's very risky, man. Kawhi Leonard, he's been known for being injury prone. He's been known for load managing. He's been known for having leg problems. His legs giving him a lot of problem, and that's not good as you age. Um, and he's not the best shooter. He's a deadly mid range shooter. He's not an elite three point shooter. He's like a very, he's good. He's a good three point shooter, but he he could be streaky. So he does rely on you know being strong, going to the hole, um, pulling up that mid range jumper. So we'll see how his game does. Uh, I don't think we're ever gonna see Kawhi Leonard be that defensive stopper that he used to be we were already getting signs of him just being an offensive player kind of not 
not guarding the best player all the time because he can't do it on both ends. He doesn't have the stamina. His body just won't let him. And with this injury, I think we're just heading down that road. Um, that The road that we were already going. Like, there's a lot of times where you're like, why is he not covering Donovan Mitchell? Why is he not covering Luka? Like, we're, we're like, come on. Like, let, we know you could do it. We've seen you be great on defense, great on offense. We want you to do it all. But his body's letting him down. And we just got to understand that Kawhi Leonard is an old 30. And he, he just can't do it on both ends. He's a great player. I love Kawhi Leonard. I was saddened when he went to the Clippers. I loved his season with with the Rap with the Raptors. It was a great season. But man, it just seems like his body doesn't let him. He could do it for one game. He could do it for a couple games, but he can't do it consistently because his body won't let him. He could put up points consistently, but he can't do it on both ends. And it, it just seems like we're just getting further and further away from that Kawhi that could just dominate on both ends. I think he could still come back and be a great player. He can still give you 24 to 28 points. He can still have those eruptions in the playoffs. But, man, it's going to get harder and harder. And it's just sad. I'm a fan of Kawhi Leonard. I kind of liked his quiet. I like his quietness. I like his his weirdness. What it do, baby? Uh, he's, he's cool. I like Kawhi Leonard. I wish him the best. I hope he recovers from this. I hope he's still the same Kawhi Leonard. He came out of San Diego State, you know, my hometown college. So, I wish Kawhi Leonard the best. I hope he comes back strong. And we'll see what he does. What do you guys think he's going to do? Is he going to opt into his player option? Is he going to opt out? Is another team going to offer him a max? Is that a risky? Would you guys risk it for him? If, if any of you guys are fans of other teams, if there's Heat fans out here, if there's, you know, Knicks fans in here, would you guys offer Kawhi Leonard the max right now if he opts out? Would you guys put that deal on the table? Because, man, that's tough. If I'm the Knicks, I do it. You haven't had a star. You 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 know that um, Julius Randle has a ceiling. You, you just go. You know what? To hell with it. Let's let's roll the dice. Let's do it. Let's see what happens. But if you're the Heat, you might be able to get another star, get somebody else. But that's all for this episode, you guys. Thank you so much for listening to the Hard to Handle Sports Podcast. This is episode number fifty six. My name is Ismael San Juan. I appreciate you guys being here with me. Um, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Subscribe to the podcast. Uh, episode 57 won't take as long as episode 56 did to come out so be on the lookout for that and have a great rest of your day um out